bit of a question around um, the opposite end of the scenario where we might be destocking and coming out the spring with um, with lower stock numbers to handle that spring growth. And uh, so, you know, what would the cost be if we don't have quality and quantity feed in the spring? Uh, yeah. Maybe the risk of being overstocked now with the right class of stock, each of mature animals that you can peel a bit off the back of mm -hmm. uh, for, for four or five weeks, and then then we go for it in the spring. Can you comment on that? Because not everyone is in a is a bad state, but it's a good one to think about quality in the spring. So um, the best thing about it is, um, and that's a great what if scenario, and we've got time to plan for it. So the first thing I'd say is maximize the value of what you have on hand already. Uh, and there is a real danger, especially on a hill country that we could lose, uh, lose quality. And there's some very good uh, management techniques around that. We've seen the deferred grazing work that's been done, and I encourage you to have a look at that with ag research. Uh, and generally, that means that um, you know you you can uh, defer the defer the pasture growth on areas that you can easily control. Make sure that you look after your hills and keep the quality as much as you can on the hills. You can come back to those easy areas later without too much of an uh, of an impact. But I go back to saying maximizing um, the 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 potential of the stock that you have if uh, if those ewes come through to weaning and they've got cracking lambs at their at feet and they're in good condition, it sets you up so well for next year. So, um, and and uh, approach it with, uh, you know, always farm for the best year, plan for the worst. So, um, you know, have a look and do the sums, do it very quickly and there's plenty of people to help you. Perhaps there is an opportunity to go out and, uh, and purchase a line of trading animals that will help you maintain quality at the same time improve your bank balance. Now, David Todd had, has had a lot to do with the work we did with the drought group. I'm just wondering, Toddy, if there's a couple of gems you've got to support what Bob's given us, if you would mind joining us. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Oh, I think it's been a really good presentation and succinct. Uh, my observation from what we experienced through the drought a couple of years ago was the people that had a plan ahead of time were able to make decisions early and get on with it. And it just stuck out like the proverbial, uh, the people that ended up with difficulty really didn't have a plan at all. And those that did have a plan got on, made decisions early and dealt with the situation pretty bloody well. Hmm. I'd reinforce that too, David. And one of the key things is, is actually write that plan down. I'm not talking about screeds upon screeds, it's right down there. And so that you can actually go back and reflect on it as well and other people can see it and share it. Yeah. I think a, a, a plan too gives you, it just makes it crystal clear in terms of focusing on, on what you can control because what's in the plan tends to be the stuff that you can control. Toddy, um, the other thing I think is really important, and I've made a few notes here from the, the call, uh, Rob's delivery. Don't be frightened to reach out. And, and you part of the Rural Support Trust, and I think... There was a big thing. We dealt with well over a couple of hundred calls through that period. Um, and you're reaching out, build a team around you. Would you like to pick up on that? Well, I think one of Farmstrong's big five ways to wellness is, is stay or keep connected. And, and, you know, the term reaching out sometimes scares people, but it, perhaps another way of phrasing it might be just maintain your networks. Because a lot of the time, you know, people are playing tennis or they're playing golf or they go and watch footy with people or whatever. And obviously with lockdowns, that, a lot of that was limited, but we don't have that now. And it's just a when the going gets tough, it's a matter of maintaining those and not necessarily trying to start new ones. And you can often have a really trusted advisor that you can just have a yarn to as you normally would. It just helps, you know, problem sheds, a problem halved. Yeah, thanks, Toddy. I'm just going to pick up, Rob, on a few things here that I've, I've noted down. Um, that control what you can control is one of the most important things. We can spend a lot of energy um, moaning about stuff we have no control over, and, and it's draining, right? So put the positive energy in. And I like your plan one. Plan it, write it down, and it doesn't have to be complicated. A simple line like you had with those lambs, and they're gone by what date? Um, and share that plan, because... I know myself and I got myself into a bit of a hole that um, I didn't share it with those that I should have, like, like my partner, the shepherds and family. 
And I think a big thing Toddy touched on and you've touched on too is build a team. So bring your bank manager in, use the power of the team around you um, is a big one. There's a heap of experience out there in your community. Um, it is your farm. You know your farm better than anyone. But use the experience in that around you, around the seasons, how it works in the community. Um, we've just seen some of the flooding. You know, the older head knows what's going on, helps the younger head get through. Um, I think a big thing, and Toddy touched on it, and you have too, is while you're doing it on farm, even just getting on farm for an, up farm for an afternoon, and we look at surfing for farmers, for example, it's been a great little niche for those who like surfing. It's even getting off your farm and, and, and going somewhere for a cup of tea or a coffee or down to the beach for a walk. Just clears your head. The other one I like is talking about that early decision, and you know my Irish one, um, and I'll, I'll recite it. An apparently bad decision made early is usually better than a good decision made too late. It's a bit Irish, but um, if you think about it, it, it works. So there are a few things now. I'm just looking, um, just looking here. We've got another question. What about looking forward and how we can build more resilience into our systems for the upcoming seasons? We seem to be dealing with more and more disruptions and droughts. So probably asking, is that going to be our business as, business as usual going forward? And, and how do we incorporate that into our plans, Rob? Yeah. And, and this is one of these great things that I'm fortunate enough to have the opportunity to look on now, is when, we've, when we're faced with these times of adversity of, of such things as droughts, floods, et cetera, and, uh, and, and, and the best thing to do, and I'd say to Natasha, is, is look back at what worked this time and build it into your business. That's how you build resilience, is look back and say, well, that actually worked selling those 300 store lambs back in December when the money was good and I knew in my heart and hearts that they were still going to be here at the end of May. Taking the money then created so much more opportunities for me further down, further down the line. So build into your farm plan the things that work under adversity because if they work under adversity, they're most likely to be staggeringly successful under when there's a great opportunity there. Um, so uh, that's one way that you can build resilience is, is actually work out what has worked for you in the past, document it or build it into your farm system. Um, but without a doubt, and I've, I've really got to reinforce what David, uh, David has said here, is that if, for a resilient farm business, for any sort of farm business, you've got to have a purpose and a plan to create that purpose. You know what your farm can do and will not do make sure that you're going to try and farm it to maximize it and build a plan as i said farm for the best year plan for the worst so once once you've got that plan it then frees up your mental capacity to really look across the horizon because you've already done the work behind you so that would be one of my key things here to build resilience going forward you've got to have a plan about how you're going to handle these handle all sorts of things Tips for turning the community anxiety into positive outcomes, getting the sharing going. And we're starting to see a little bit of some of the community groups, but um, yeah, just your observations, Rob, on how we can use the power of the community in a positive way. Mm -hmm. um, every community's got a champion. Everybody, every community's got somebody who wants to uh, promote and do good in the community. First thing I'd say, and here over in Tiaka, we've got some wonderful people who do that. Just support them. Support them with a with a kind word saying, well, if you organise it, I'll turn up. Um, and that builds community resilience because people can begin to uh, rely and communicate with each other. Um, don't, uh, As I said, we've got a bad habit of coming together in adversity. Why don't we come together to celebrate things as well? Uh, you know, have a... Uh, um, have a, an opportunity to welcome new members to the district, which is uh, which is a really good thing, a strong thing that happens a lot in the dairy farming circles, welcome new people to the district. You're sending a clear message that you are actually welcoming them into, into a place so uh, that you that you value quite high, uh, quite highly. So yes, it does take work. I'm not going to uh, denote that it does take work, um, but support those who are willing to do it. Uh, especially in our rural communities. It used to just happen as of right, and it used to be the same people that made it happen. They have, they're not there anymore or they've lost uh, energy. So what I'd say is um, encourage people to do it. 
Paul, you're the chair, national, chairman of the National Executive uh, our Pharma Council. Um, you're down the Wairapa. Um, you guys have had a few ups and downs in your farming life there. Have you got anything that you can sort of add or like to add to support what Rob's been uh, letting us know? Well, look, I, thanks, Mark. And um, look, I think, you know, uh, I think we're, what has resonated with what Rob has just said is around celebrating the good times, right? And so, look, we, you know, um, you know, our thoughts are with our, our, our fellow farmers further up the East Coast and also down south going through the drought, which... And so, but look, we've actually, we're living, it, it was Gisborne, it was the land of milk and honey, now it's the Wairarapa. So we're actually um, having a great season, to be fair. So, and every dog has his day, right? So I think the key point there is that we do celebrate. You know, you do you do give yourself a pat on the back. And so, look, you know, it's actually, things are going okay. We're, we're trying to set ourselves up, trying to maximise that potential, you know, get as many ewes and lamb, et cetera, as we can. So, um and, and just make those observations like we've, you know, the rams out with the ewes at the moment. We're just noting down, you know, how many, how many are marked that are going through the gates so we can sort of track that stuff. So we, you know, one mob at the moment, we're 20% behind in terms of numbers at the same time last year. So it's a little bit of information, but it just gives us a bit of confidence about actually things are going okay, things are tracking well. What do we need to do? Do we need to chuck some more rams in? So, you know, small steps along the way is what Rob was talking about build the picture of your business, build, understand what's happening with those various groups of livestock, et cetera. So, and, you know, personally, just, I feel better. I feel like I'm more in control of what's going on. Um, I might all tend to cast it in the springtime, but look, at least what we've done, you know, we're trying to make those incremental steps about controlling what we can control, understanding how, how things are working, how the, how the different classes of livestock are going. And it's just, it's just that um, I think knowledge or, or information is power, right? It just gives you confidence about what's going on and, and you feel better, you know, you feel better and you feel more confident to make those decisions as both David and, and Rob have talked about, which is awesome. Thanks, Paul. And uh, that, um, But you've had a bit to do with community groups and you're asking, you know, is there a place or a role? Now, you've helped set up a few. So, Parks, are you going to be on the spot now and share maybe a couple of gems that you see where this does happen with groups you've helped? Yeah, no, thanks for, thanks for asking me the question, Mark. Um, no, I've, you know, as you know, and people that, that know me, I've, I've got around a lot of farmer-led catchment community groups and it's a clear bit of feedback that I've got uh, from those groups and those communities that... Uh, they find a lot of support in coming together as that catchment collective. Uh, and for a lot of groups, that's been a big driver in, in, in why they've formed. So, um, you know, and it mirrors a lot of what Rob's had to say, but it's realising that that you're not on your own by being, being part of that group. And, um, you know, kind of re revisiting and, and kind of re reconnecting with community can have... Uh, you know, quite a powerful impact on um, on how people feel about uh, you know all the change uh, that they're facing and and makes them feel as if they're taking back a little bit of control um, and and able to focus on what is in their control because you know as Rob said, as soon as you're focusing on everything that's outside of your control, that's when uh, uh, stuff doesn't get past the two o'clock in the morning test, as I call it. You know, that's when you're waking up at two o'clock in the morning, um, getting, you know, s s stewing about it, which which isn't a healthy space to be in. Thanks, Parksy. Uh, Dave Martin, I'm gonna uh, just jump onto you. And, and I know, Dave, you're up in the area around Wilder and you've got the block up the top. I'm just wondering if you might have a couple of things at the moment that currently you see that would help the situation under the floodwaters? Yeah, g'day Mark and, and thanks Rob. Um, yeah, we're, it's been pretty hard up here. Um, probably the biggest thing that I'm getting from people at the moment is frustration. You know, they still can't access their farms to um, start making a plan as to actually uh, any plan to go forward. Um, yeah, it's probably the biggest one talking around. Is, is purely a frustration and I'm not quite sure how we're going to deal with that other than time and keeping on talking. Um, yeah, it, it's going to be an interesting one. And, and I'd, I'd love to hear if, if some guys have dealt with this sort of thing, be it drought or flood. And a flood's pretty instant, really. But um, 
as opposed to creeping drought, but you know, how other people are, are handling the frustration side of things, trying to, you know, you can, we can build 60 different plans, but if we don't have a, an idea on the bigger picture, which plan can we actually put some money into or, or put some drive on? Dave, just a question for you around some of the things we can chat about as community. Um, know the community pretty well, probably been through a similar experience many, many years ago. Um, the community is pretty strong in supporting each other up there. And uh, is that happening? Yeah, it is. Yeah. He's, um, one thing is there's heaps of chat. We might just be lamenting the situation we're in. Um, a lot of it's finding someone who's in a worse condition to make yourself feel better. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's it, it's just that contact, ringing, ringing people. I've, I've rung people I haven't talked to for a month just to see how they are, you know, get a picture of what they're up to. Um, you, know, you, you never know when someone's going to open up to you um, about something that you weren't expecting is probably the biggest one. Um, just getting ready, you know, you sort of got to be a bit prepared when you make, make some of these contacts that you never know quite what you're going to get. You, you might be that one phone call that someone, um, you know, touches someone, I suppose, probably might be a better phrase, but, and they suddenly it opens the gates and, and, you know, being prepared for that's quite important when you're making these contacts. Um, uh, Dave, I'd like to share with you. So I was involved in uh, 2004 with the Whanganui Manawatu floods um, uh, with Stephen, um, oh, I can't remember his last name, but um, we were very fortunate. We brought a legend up into the Terrakina Valley by the name of uh, Ian Kirkpatrick. Um, and, uh, and he came in to talk to the farmers. And we're talking about the, you know, it was probably a similar situation here and the bridges were gone. Uh, etc. And, and so Ian came to share his experiences through Cyclone Bowler. And something he said to me stuck, uh, stuck with me uh, for a long, long time. And he said, look, uh, he said, in these, um, at this uh, point in life when there's just so much chaos and you just don't know what to make sense of or anything like that, he said, one of the things that worked really well was just start small. And he, he suggested to people, he said, just make sure that your driveway and your letterbox and you can get to all those sorts of things. Try and return that to a little bit of normality so everybody in, you know, that lived in the house, including yourself, has got a little bit of normality to return home to. He said, and, and at that stage, people couldn't get out on the farms, the same situation. He said, look, what you'll find out there is going to be heartbreaking and you're just going to scratch your head, but at least you're going to be coming home to... Uh, you know, you're not going to be treading mud, in, mud into the house and those sorts of things. And that really stuck with me, is, you know, start small with the things that you, you can benefit from of just trying to restore a bit of normality to the chaos that's, uh, that's around you. So Ian Kirkpatrick was not only an amazing rugby player, he was a pretty amazing person to bring that to the table as well. Yeah, it's interesting, Rob. Um, um... A lot of mates down south and talking to guys that went on to farms after the big earthquakes in North Canterbury and uh, you know total farm devastation you know there was just wasn't anything in any shape or form that resembled the farm before the earthquake and a mate of mine said to me it was just sitting down with these guys and, it, and it, it's exactly what you said it was a little thing it might have been just tidying up the workshop you know so that they could get in and find some fencing gear or sitting down with them over a cup of tea and making a list of mm. things that, you know, you know, big list and short list, the things that they could achieve if, if there was a group of guys that were going to turn up on the farm and give them a hand, a list of things that they could do or, you know, go next step and go longer term. It, mm. it was all about writing some stuff down, as you said earlier in your presentation, making some plans, but it was, he said, going on to these farms and helping people who were just totally distraught and, and trying to, bring some sense into their lives. Yeah, and and unfortunately, and, and we've got a number of experiences like that, like the Kaikoura earthquake, the Cyclone Bowl, or the 2004 floods and, and those sorts of things. So there are other experiences out there. And now, thankfully, you know, due to technology, we're a much more connected uh, world than what we were. So we don't have to fly in Kirkpatrick in by a helicopter any morning anymore because the road's buggered. You know, he can zoom in. And um, so Beef and Lamb, hats off to you guys for starting to try and uh, put these things together. 
Yeah, well, hey, Dave, thanks for that. No, I can assure you there's a lot of going on the background to try and connect with your communities as soon as we can get in there to help with some of that planning. But um, look, I just want to take credit to Dave as well too, because he does uh, some other really good stuff in the Warrior with the Expo and trying to connect farmers in the region to technology and that. And that's the same thing supporting our community. Hey, Richard Lee, are you still there? I see that you're on, and I'm going to pick on you next because we've got a little bit. Um, you've got a bit of veterinary background, and I just wonder if there's any sort of tips and tricks around that you've seen through your years of practice around drought and, and feed shortages and stuff that supports what Rob's been up to. Yep, I knew this was coming because I'm next to Dave and I can see Rob giggling and uh, so I'm prepared. Um, lots of things been said today, all good stuff. I like to fly the helicopter perspective up a bit, up a bit and just repeat, repeat some things that really resonate with me. Start small, ask others, document. And here's two, two words from me. Remember and learn. Okay? Because I can remember having conversations like this in 2007. It's 15 years ago. It's not you. We've got to learn. Uh, there are new norms. We need to recognize those. There's a wealth of information out there. There's a wealth of help. There's, there's new norms and connectivity, all the things that you've said there, Rob. So, so the, the new thing we need to do, the two new things we need to do, and one uh, um, predates the other, is remember and learn. Nothing about animal health, you know. So long, so long. Exactly as we said. Exactly as we said. Sell store, you know, 45% of the respondents said that. You haven't got animal health issues because somebody else has got them. Yep. And that's how you build resilience into the future, don't you? By remembering these sorts of situations and yes. learning from them. And, that, and, and so just reinforcing that to Natasha that, you know, work out what's worked in the past because it will yes. probably work in the future as well. Yes, exactly. Time to mute. Thanks, Richard. Um, look, that brings up uh, something that's a favourite of mine. Um, we have subject matter experts, and it's called ECME. It's an acronym, and I hate it um, because every expert has experience. They're learning somewhere. So mine is ECME, share my experience. And just heard from a number of people sharing their experiences. Some of my experiences that I share weren't that good, and they had really crap outcomes. And if I can, by sharing that um, with someone else, avoid them going down the same path, it's a bit like... We tried this, it didn't work. So next time we did it this way and it worked. That's some of the best um, learnings, some of the best uh, stuff reinforcing Richard's comment that you can have. And within your community, there are some great people with grey hair. Is that you, Rob? Yeah. And, and false teeth, as they say. Um, they quite often have had bad experiences. They can avoid you happening. Um, and, and that's what our community is about, is sharing um, right through our age group uh, I think, can I add another thing, uh, Rob, around your team thing I've been thinking about, is that quite often when these things come on, as the leader of the team or the owner of the farm or the manager of the farm, you think you've got to have really wide shoulders and carry everybody, right? Um, it's amazing if you include everybody in the discussion, into the challenges, the issues, how even all members have something to add and contribute to dealing with challenges. Is that your experience when you go around the farms you work with where there's a good team? Mm -hmm. And one thing I'd do to reinforce that, Mark, is say most people that you're surrounded with yourself with want to help. They just don't know how to help. So if you go, right, this is the issue that I'm facing. You know, this is some of the potential solutions. The bloke or the, the girl in the corner will put her hand up and go, hey, I can do that. And uh, and and you're well on your well on your uh, way to do it. You know, there's there's going to be some um, millennial there that knows their way around that spreadsheet, that feed budget spreadsheet, a lot better than you, and they're more than willing to do it because they they want to be valued as part of the community or team. So, you know, you're not share, you're not burdening people. You're sharing and giving them an opportunity. Look at it that way, Rob. Um Look, thanks a lot. Any other final comments from you you'd like to reinforce? And I just want to, in saying that, thank those people I put on the spot. That's the trouble when you put your name and Zoom doesn't allow you not to. I can see who's there and I sort of picked on a few of you, but I really value 
the support and input you gave to Rob's presentation as well. So Rob, back to you, any sort of final comments? Uh, three, three final comments is control what you can control, what you can control and don't worry about anything else. Um, the time spent planning is never wasted and uh, communicate and keep in touch with those people who are desperate to help you. A big thanks to you, Rob. Um, really um, good, helpful key points there. Um, they don't change, the key principles don't change. Um, but also I'd just like to, to reach out and thank um, Dan, Dan and Nick who did the first webinar and Tom Fraser who did the second one in the series. And now Rob McNabb's name is up on lights there with that as well. So again to you all, and especially Rob, thank you so much for attending and I hope uh, you've enjoyed your lunch break with us on this webinar.